So now hopefully you understand the basis of covalent bonding and ionic bonding. What I'm going to talk about now is metallic bonding. Now this occurs within metals. So the metals that you'll see on the left hand side of the periodic table, this type of bonding occurs within the elements. When metals turn into compounds, for example sodium chloride, let's say NaCl, this is now a compound and it's not going to have metallic bonding in there. Sodium chloride is a salt and it's going to be bound together via ionic bonding. And so when we speak about metallic bonding, we're talking about pure elements, so elements which are metals, or we're talking about alloys. And the alloys are just basically mixtures of different metals. So an example of that, of course, is steel. So just remember, once the metals make a compound, such as sodium chloride, sodium oxide, calcium oxide, etc., they are not going to be bound together via um, metallic bonding anymore. It's going to be ionic bonding, or in some cases, covalent bonding. Okay, so let's have a look at the, um, the bonding within pure sodium. So it's going to look something like this. We have each circle here representing a sodium atom to begin with. And if we have a look at a sodium atom in a bit more detail, sodium is in group one of the periodic table. And that means its outer electron shell has only got one electron within it. And so I haven't drawn the inner electron shells just to make this look a bit more simple, but we have to obtain another seven electrons in order to make this outer shell happy. Because remember the outer energy level of sodium can have a maximum of eight electrons. This is the third shell. So the, the first shell, of course, can fit two electrons, and then the second and third shells can fit eight electrons each. So that's not really going to be viable because we're not going to be able to obtain those electrons from anywhere else. Sodium is not going to covalently bond with seven other sodiums to make a, a covalent molecule, if you like, because eight sodiums all bound together and all overlapping is not actually going to work. So there must be a different way in which the sodium obtains a full outer shell. And of course there is. Rather than add seven electrons, what the sodium is going to do is just remove this outer electron. So this outer electron leaves and we form sodium plus. Like so. So you form your electron and your sodium plus ion here. And these are actually what are going to take part in the metallic bonding. So if I just scroll back up. Now, each one of these circles is now going to represent a positive ion. Okay? So each one is a positive ion like so. And so where are the electrons gone? Well, the electrons, I'm going to draw them in green, are free to buzz around. Right, not in green, sorry, in yellow. They're free to buzz around wherever they like. And we call these delocalized. So we call these electrons delocalized. Like that. And so the phenomenon of having electrons buzzing around all over the place, we call that a sea of delocalized electrons. The reason being because the electrons are flowing, so just like the oceans, they're flowing throughout the metal, and so they can move around. Delocalized means that they're no longer local just to one atom, so they can go wherever they want. And the reason why this makes for such a strong structure is because every one of these electrons is going to feel an attraction to all of the positive ions, because negative electrons and positive ions opposites attract, and they will feel, draw this in purple, what is known as an electrostatic force of attraction. So whenever they're close to any ion, that is going to be happening. Obviously this is happening in 3D, I've only drawn it in 2D to make it simple, but you have a sea of delocalized electrons which are feeling electrostatic forces of attraction with the positive metal ions. Now, in order to turn this solid metal into a liquid, we need to break these down. We need to ensure that these, um, these metal atoms, or ions as they now are, are going to separate independently. And so, therefore, all of these electrostatic forces need to be broken down so that the solid metal can turn into a liquid and so that the atoms or the ions are free to move. The, reasons I've, the reason sorry, I've said atom or ion is that we can think of them as ions here, but overall this is not ionic bonding because 
we have a um, attraction between electrons and positive ions, not between negative ions and positive ions. So this is not ionic bonding, there is a difference, but it is using the same electrostatic force of attraction that we have seen previously in ionic bonding. And so one more thing I want to quickly show you is how about if we had a different metal in a different group of the periodic table? Down here, we have magnesium. And again, I've only drawn the outer shell electrons, but exactly the same thing is going to happen here. Magnesium has a choice of either gaining six electrons, which is going to be pretty difficult, or only losing two. And so that one is more favorable. Both of these electrons in the outer shell are going to leave. And so we are going to end up with a magnesium ion and this magnesium ion is going to be plus two charged or a two plus ion. And obviously each magnesium atom is going to produce this and also it's given away two electrons. And so why is that important? Well, if we have a look at the structure, we would have magnesium ions arranged like this. Obviously all of these are two plus. Um, I've only drawn the first few, but you get the idea. We are going to have two plus ions and for each one of these, we are going to have two electrons given off. So, for example, two electrons have been given off by this ion here, two electrons by the next one, and so on. And so we are actually going to have more free electrons, double in fact, the amount of free electrons flowing around in magnesium than we are in the sodium. And therefore, there are more electrons which are feeling the electrostatic force of attraction to the ions. And now on top of this, so this would already make the structure stronger than the previous sodium structure that we saw. On top of this, each electron is actually feeling a stronger force of attraction. The reason being because each ion is a 2 plus rather than a 1 plus. And therefore, electrons are even more attracted to this strongly positive magnesium than they would have been up here to our sodium, which only has a 1 plus. And so we have a double-edged sword here where we have more electrons being attracted to the positive ions and holding them in place. And also the attraction between the ions and each electron is greater as well. Therefore, magnesium is way stronger than sodium. It's harder to break down magnesium and therefore magnesium will have a higher melting point. And so, of course, you don't need to remember any figures, but just to show you um, with real experimental data, the melting point, so the MP of sodium, is around about 371 degrees Kelvin, which in real terms is about 98 degrees Celsius. The 98 degrees Celsius there for sodium. Magnesium, however, has a melting point of 900 and 22 degrees Kelvin, which is the same as around about 649 degrees Celsius. So 649 degrees versus 98 degrees. Now magnesium and sodium are in the same period of the periodic table. Magnesium just has one extra proton in its nucleus than sodium does. So they're very similar in terms of size but magnesium has this massive advantage on its melting point. And the reason for that is the, the ionic charge on the magnesium two plus ions, and of course the attraction to um, more electrons than you find within sodium. Okay, so that explains the difference in melting points. Now, another property of metals, which of course we're all aware of, is that they conduct electricity. If you put a metal knife into a plug wall socket, then you have probably done yourself a massive amount of damage. So please don't do that. Just take my word for it. But the reason it would do damage is because metals conduct electricity. The reason they conduct electricity is because of this C of delocalized electrons. So going back up here, C of delocalized electrons. These electrons can move. And these electrons are, of course, charged. And the movement of charge, the free-flowing movement of charge, is electricity. If we add an electrical current, let's say, to this side of our sodium, that means that the electrons are going to move. So the electrons can therefore move through the metal, like this, and out the other side. 
not out the other side of the whole metal, but of course from one end to another. And if we had joined this up to a circuit, then it creates a circuit in which current can flow. So this movement of electrons actually creates an electrical current, and that is the reason why metals will conduct electricity when they are solids. Of course, you've seen that covalent compounds and ionic compounds will not conduct electricity when they are solid, and that is because any charged substances, or species, sorry, such as an electron or an ion, is not free to move in the solid state. When you move on to liquid state, of course, ionic compounds do, but they don't in the solid state. Metals will conduct electricity in the solid state and in the liquid state. Because if we melt them down, then that means that the metal, uh, the metal ions are free to move around and of course electricity can be conducted there as well. So that's important. You need to know why metals conduct electricity as well as knowing why they are solid at room temperature. So I'm going to stop there. That was just sort of a brief overview, but I hope that's given you an idea. If you do have any questions, then please do put them in the comments below, but I will see you in the next video.